All right, so let's just start here. So um, this is a scenario that's uh, kind of good to consider uh, in an attempt at uh, reconciling your intuition with how we analyze physical pictures in this class. So um, imagine a merry-go-round. It's a playground object. It's a kind of circular thing fixed in the center. It spins. People can like stand on top of it. There are rails that you can hold on to. It's a kind of children's thing. Let me draw a representation of that so we have something to look at as we talk about it. So we have a top view of merry-go-round. Imagine it's uh, spinning about the center here. And I guess uh, you are considering someone who is standing someplace on the merry-go-round, maybe near the edge. And this is a top view, so it's this is their head, this is their body. Okay. And um, it says, a girl says, she needs to hold the safety rail real tight or else she will fly outward. Okay, and I think that's the kind of the feeling that all of us relate to. If you've been on merry-go-round or if you've been spun around before, you get the sensation, well, I gotta, I, I have to do something to stay in. Like if I stop doing it, I will, um, you know, fly outward. So, so that's the picture we have in mind. Let's just say, um, so this uh, girl is kind of spinning on the edge of the merry-go-round and at some point she will reach this point. So, if she does suddenly let go, will she indeed fly off the merry-go-round directly away from its center? Oh wait, um, this is kind of bad position to put her in, so let me actually put her over here. So. Um, what you have to think about is her tangential velocity. So she used to be moving in circle. So at this point, she's undergoing tangential velocity, moving that way. And as she's moving around, uh, the tangential velocity changes. It kind of goes tangent to the edge of the circle. So at this point, her velocity is going straight to the right. So the to the point that it's asking. If she does suddenly let go, will she indeed fly off the merry-go-round directly away from its center? Okay, so this is what I would like if she was uh, moving directly away from its center. So imagining taking this picture and if she were um, being pulled away, uh, if she's, uh, she flies off directly away from the center, then at some moment in time, she'll be here and she'll be flying off in this direction. So um, maybe, you know, it, at the beginning, maybe she starts off uh, slower, but then later she's moving faster. So that would be the speed. Um, or um, if you imagine tracking our position over time, what we would be saying, if we do say yes, yes, she will indeed fly off the merry-go-round directly away from the center, then we can track her position over time. Um, she would be here, and then later at some time here, and later at some time here. And I think uh, as you draw these pictures, you should get a sense that, no, that's not what actually happens. And this comes from Newton's first law, or Newton's second law, either of those two. Because she has this tangential velocity here, when she lets go, and there's no more force holding her in place, then she's going to move in straight line. That's how she should move. So at some later point in time, she'll be here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and so on. And I hope as you look at this drawing, you see two interesting things. One is that she does, in some sense, fly off the merry-go-round. The edge of the merry-go-round is right here. So she does fly off in the sense that when she's over here, she's not on the merry-go-round anymore. And you can even quantify, you can look at the distance from the uh, merry-go-round center to where she was. You know, she was at radius away. And at some later time, she is indeed farther away. This uh, distance is greater than the radius. So in some sense, she does fly off the merry-go-round. But what she doesn't do is she doesn't fly off the merry-go-round in this way. So what's uh, pushing her off the merry-go-round is the fact that she was already moving with some speed. So when there stops being a force, um, 
when she stops where there stops being a force then she continues to move in that direction that she was moving so you know ends up that way um so you know use a diagram to explain your answer yeah that's my explanation um this doesn't happen and i think once you start drawing the diagram you can kind of see yeah this doesn't actually happen this happens and it does kind of match up with how someone flies off the merry-go-round when they stop holding on to it yeah, and that's uh, the getting a part to be. The girl looking directly at the rail she was holding on to, you know, looking at the rail that was here maybe. And she does see that she's getting farther away from that because, yeah, you are moving. And um, there's actually a bit of a nuance that I want to get to, which is I want to sketch out how the rail moves and how the girl moves. There's uh, actually a complication there that's interesting to look at. Let me get a, get to that after finishing answering C and D. So in C, the girl says, when I let go, I can feel a force pulling me away from the center. And um, I, I think this is a kind of thing to make sure that you pause, think about it, and address it. Because this is... Um, what she's saying. So, you know, if you think there's a force, you can draw a free body diagram. So let's imagine drawing a free body diagram of the girl in this position. And I'm, let, let's draw it from the top view. So by drawing it from top view, what I mean is um, we are going to not draw gravity and normal force because gravity will be into the page and the normal force will be out of the page. And, you know, it's just confusing more than anything. Those just balance each other out. So I want to draw gravity and normal force. So this is the question. Um, what this statement says is when I let go, I can feel a force pulling me away. Then she's saying that there's some kind of force pulling her away. And while she's holding onto the rails, there's a inward force and before she wasn't um, flying out because these two forces were balanced and what she would be saying is well when i let go of the rail then this is gone and because of this remaining outward force that's why i fly out now if this uh, explanation sounded convincing to you then this is what I want you to consider. What force is there that's actually pushing the girl outward? Imagine this picture. So it's, I think, quite easy to imagine what this uh, uh, rail force is. That's the contact force between her hand and the rail touching. That's where the rail force comes from. That's uh, holding her in. So if you are taking this situation seriously and trying to think about where does this outward force come from, if you need to, pause. And the answer of where does that come from is it doesn't come from anywhere. And if you are tempted to answer centrifugal force, so this is what we call a fictitious force or a pseudo force. I think a pseudo force sometimes sounds a little bit better because it you know, sounds smarter. <laughs> I don't know. Pseudo force that happens in an accelerating frame. And I will give a slightly longer explanation in a bit. But the rule we go by with in this class is we don't analyze the physical situations in an accelerating frame. For those of you who go on to become physics majors, um, or I think mechanical engineers analyzing some complex situation, you might be in a situation where you will use uh, an accelerating frame, like a rotating frame. Um, for this introductory physics class, what I implore you to stay away from or implore you to do is use inertial reference frame and stay away from using accelerating frames because even when you do learn to do it perfectly in our context, there will be some complications that you forget about and, um, and it will lead to mistakes and errors. So 
what we've drawn here is something that some someone might reasonably co um, consider in what we call rotating frame. And by rotating frame, we really mean frame uh, viewed as a perspective of the girl. And I think that's why we identify with it so easily, because that's the reference frame we were in as we are holding on to the rail. And let me address two points simultaneously. So, you know, how is rotating frame an accelerating frame? And if you are saying that this is uh, some kind of a strange frame that we shouldn't use, then what happens in an inertial reference frame? So what happens in an inertial reference frame is that this outward force simply isn't there. I mean, it just comes straight from, well, imagine uh, the girl holding onto the rating. What's pushing her outside? Like no object is touching her to push her outside. And the only non-contact force there can be is gravity, and gravity is pulling her down, not pushing her you know, outside. So, so this is the picture, point one. Now, as you look at it, you can clearly see that acceleration is not zero. If anything, you have an inward acceleration that goes with your net force coming from force of the rail. How you might ask, but she's staying in place on the merry-go-round. She's not moving inward. How is she accelerating inward? That's where you have to remember that whenever something is moving in a circle, like this girl on the merry-go-round, there is going to be centripetal, center-seeking acceleration. Because your velocity is changing direction from here to here, even when the speed remains the same, there's a change of velocity that's kind of pointed towards the center of the circle. So whenever you have something moving in a circle, uniform circular motion, think centripetal acceleration. There will always be some acceleration. And that's what this acceleration is. And it's a force with the rail that's providing that centripetal force that can produce the centripetal acceleration. So to the point of how, why she feels being pulled away from the center, I think the way I would try to explain it is the same way we feel our own weight, the apparent weight, the way we feel our weight. We actually don't feel gravity directly. Like if you are in free fall, you would feel like you are in microgravity. That's like astronauts in International Space Station. But gravitational force on them is actually pretty significant. It's like 80, 90% of the gravity on us. The way we feel gravity is we are not actually feeling the weight that's pulling us down. What we are feeling is coming from the normal force. There are contact force that's pushing us up in a lot of circumstances that's equal to the weight. And that contact force is pushing our feet up and if we are standing up, then our muscles are con constricted, uh, contracting in a way that we can stand straight up. And all of that effort that you exert um, with the normal force, that's what leads to your sensation of weight. You feel like something is pulling you down because in order for you to stay in the same, same place, you had to push yourself up. And it's the same situation here. When you have this force, that's basically trying to keep her at the same radius, then uh, that because you had to exert that inward force, you associate it with the sensation that something else is pulling you away from that effort that you have to exert. The way, because of, with the normal force and everything, you have to uh, have a force on you that's upward in order to stay in place, that upward contact force gets interpreted through your experience as something pulling you downward. So, so that's this kind of long explanation around this setup. And let me come back to one last thing that I was getting at, that there are complications involved in a, a rotating reference frame that um, you should be aware of before you are further tempted to use a rotating frame and centrifugal acceleration as a way to analyze a situation that maybe looks complicated if you analyze the inertial reference frame. Um, and I think I can illustrate that idea with this, um, with this question and the diagram designed to answer. 
So in part B, we saw this um, statement or question. The girl, looking directly at the rail she was holding on to, sees herself flying outward from center. Okay, does she see that? Let's, let's uh, take a look. So um, we have this merry-go-round. I'm just going to redraw it here because uh, I need some distance and the size to sketch out things. Here's the center. Here are the two railings. Let's say they are moving at some speed. Um, enough speed that I'm going to try to space this out in equal intervals. So in equal intervals, she'll move from here to here to here to here to here. Uh, maybe to here. Okay. Those are kind of equal spacing. So she's moving at a constant velocity. And let's make sure the railings are moving at the same speed. So this, um, let me just draw one of the railings as a way to kind of track. So the left railing goes from here to here to here. How many did I draw? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I think these are about the same spacing as the way I drew her. So let's uh, look at critically what the girl sees as she looks back at this center of the of the um, the merry-go-round. So you start out with the railing being to her left, and watch this line of sight from the girl on the merry-go-round back to the center of merry-go-round. So. In this inertial reference frame, where you know I'm just uh, plotting things as they move, you know the girl is moving uh, with no acceleration, just moving in a straight line. The railing is undergoing centripetal acceleration, moving in a circle. I think in this picture everything's clear, nothing so confusing. I don't think I forgot anything. You know she is moving farther away. All right, okay, what's there? Let me try drawing this picture in the rotating reference frame. And I think uh, if uh, people were given the task to do, this is how I imagine a lot of people drawing. So, um, so let's say uh, I might have to draw this a little smaller. So let's say you got these two railings. And the, in a uh, rotating reference frame, then um, you know these railings would uh, stay in place. That's the rotating reference frame. And you have this girl, and you are thinking, oh, the centrifugal force in the the pseudo force in the rotating frame it points it directly outward, so the girl is going to you know get pushed directly outward. So let me just draw one, two, three, four of these. One, two, three, four. And you might, uh, someone could naively say, this way of analyzing is equivalent to this way of analyzing. So let's use whatever is easiest for the problem at hand. That's the temptation. Now, watch the picture carefully. See if they are actually indeed um, identical or comparable to each other. And as you draw these lines of sight, I hope you see that those two big pictures are not actually like each other. There are relative positions that are kind of messed up. You, so I drew this, uh, so let me label this. One, two, three, four, five. With each snapshot, I drew these uh, railings. One, two, three, four, five. And you can begin to see that it's not always going to be the case that these railings stay to the left of the, the girl. Like here it looks like it did. And starting with the here, uh, no, the railing is beginning to like move ahead of the girl. The railings three moved far ahead of the girl. Uh, four moved far ahead of the girl. So in order to get a physical picture in this uh, rotating frame that's uh, actually physically comparable to this, this is what you have to do. Um, so first the two might be okay, but starting with the third one, you really have to start bending the path so that the girl isn't actually on a straight outward trajectory in this rotating frame. Instead, 
she is in some kind of um, curvy path, then you can see that um, with that path, then now when you draw this line of sight, the railing is to our right as it appears to be here. So, um, so the motion of the girl in this rotating frame, it's not simple like a straight line. It's actually this curved path. And if you are interested in how this happens, how to take this into account, what you have to look up is something called the Coriolis force. There's a, another fictitious force that's not centrifugal force, another fictitious force that appears in a rotating frame. And for it to appear, you need some uh, radial velocity, I think. So when you have some radial velocity in a rotating frame, you basically have an um, effective force that's pushing the thing to the side. That's what that Coriolis force is. And what I had to tell you is, um, in this class, I haven't given you the tools to analyze a rotating re uh, reference frame while including the Coriolis effect, the Coriolis force. And in upper division classes, like uh, uh, the classical mechanics or analytical mechanics, where they do use things like rotating reference frame, they will give you tools how to handle things like a Coriolis force. Um, but for this introductory class, my strongest recommendation to you is to stay in the inertial reference frame. So that you don't have to worry about these sneaky forces like a Coriolis force that you might not have known about. The fact that this railing moves ahead of the girl um, in its own circle compared to the straight line trajectory of the girl, you didn't have to know that ahead of time. That just comes straight from your analysis, from your picture. But um, rotating frames involve a lot of complication. So uh, even though it might feel like using centrifugal forces is easier in one problem, it's going to lead you into a path where you're going to see contradiction unless you learn how to correctly handle the Coriolis force. So, so yeah, that's the explanation I wanted to give. For part D, why does someone sitting on the center of the merry-go-round not feel thrown outward? It's because, you know, the formula for centripetal acceleration is a V squared over R. And actually this version is, can be a little bit deceptive because you'll say at the center, R is equal to zero. So, you know, why doesn't this blow up instead? Uh, so let me write the other version, which is um, relating it to the same radius and what's called the angular velocity. This is um, amount of radiance per second. And here it would be angular velocity omega squared. Uh, it comes down to, you know, there's a relationship between speed of V and the, the display, the, the angular velocity omega, which is uh, V is R times omega. So, um, so if you're in the center, not only is your radius zero, your speed is also zero. And um, rewriting it in this form makes it more obvious to you that um, since omega will be the same for any point on the merry-go-round, your angular velocity is the same for every point on the reached body. As your r goes to zero, your acceleration will go to zero as well. So that's um, so so someone sitting in the center, there is no centripetal force needed, meaning they didn't have to hold on to anything to stay in the same place. That's why they don't feel thrown outward, they don't feel moved around, because they're not having to hold on to anything to re maintain their place.